Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining and a big welcome to the first BCT webinar of 2022. You. My name is Joel Stibbard and I'm an ecologist in the education team at the Biodiversity Conservation Trust or the BCT. In my role, I have the pleasure of not only informing landholders and the general public of the values of private land conservation, but also to help build a conservation community within which we can all learn new ways to understand and protect our natural world. The webinar today provides a means for us to do just that. So thanks again for being here. And before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we're all meeting today, recognising their ongoing connection to land, waters and culture. I'm here on the land of my birth, beautiful Awabakal country, otherwise known as Newcastle. And I know we have people calling in from right across New South Wales and possibly even the country. So I pay my ultimate respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people with us today. And when you think about it, this webinar is all about utilising modern technology to further our knowledge of many of the fauna species that have been revered by Aboriginal people for over thousands of years. The modern technology I refer to, of course, are wildlife cameras. Now, motion sensor, infrared, trail cameras, call them what you will, they have become a staple in contemporary fauna survey work. Indeed, many of you may already own one or more of these, but they can be a frustrating hit and miss piece of equipment. So how do we maximise the hits? And how do we minimise the misses? And how can we target particular species and particular habitats? Well, Joel, great question. I'm glad you asked because we're honoured to have the BCT's senior ecologist and fauna survey guru, Dr. Mason Crane, present his tips and tricks for using wildlife cameras. With him is BCT principal ecologist, Dr. James Brazil Boast, who will speak briefly after Mason on the strategy the BCT has developed to involve our keen landholders in citizen science projects. Utilising the skills you have and will gain through the presentation today, to further our knowledge of native fauna populations in New South Wales. Following the presentations, we'll have time for some Q&A with both Mason and James. There's a chat window on the side of your screen, so if you have anything you'd like to ask, use the Q&A function to submit your questions and we'll do our best to get them answered. So to introduce Dr Crane, I'd like to acknowledge the amazing work he's done in academia and landholder education, dedicating 20 years to working with the Fenner School of Environment and Society at the Australian National University before gracing us with his presence here at the BCT in 2019. He's co-authored some fantastic resources over the years, such as these books here. And as part of his research, has set up many a camera in many a location. He is here to impart some of his wisdom onto us. And for that, we are thankful. I've said more than enough at this point, so I'll hand it over to Mason. Take it away, buddy. Okay, thanks for that, Joel. Um, yeah, great to be on this webinar today, and hopefully we'll do a few more over the years to come. But I guess, um, as I say, and you learn more from your failures than your success, and I guess that's how I learn a lot about uh, camera trapping. So over the years, um, and it's an important thing to keep in mind when you go out and do it, you, you, um, you'll make mistakes, but it's important to work out where it went wrong and... Uh, how to do it better next time. So what are some of the tips, tricks and limitations of wildlife cameras? Well, first of all, um, surveying for wildlife has, has been a really been a challenge, I guess, for whether you're an ecologist or a land manager or a property owner. Like some of these animals are very cryptic and hard to find. Traditional methods like trapping are great. I guess they have limitations as well. They can uh, be very time consuming, it can be expensive if you've got to pay staff to get out there and do it. And you know, it's good for some species and not so good for others. Bird surveying, um, you know, you need to have a good ear, you need to be able to under, uh, hear the birds and know what species they are from their calls to be an effective bird surveyor. Um, and then there's spotlighting. And the spotlighting is, uh, is, a, is a good way to go and an easy thing for people to do. So I encourage people to do it. But, you know, when the vegetation is very thick, it's very hard to see through it. So there, it's always been a challenge. But um, things have been changing over the last decade with um, wildlife survey techniques. You know, um, it's a technological revolution in wildlife survey techniques, I guess you could call it. 
uh, there's technology now where you can take a, a glass of water out of a creek and examine the DNA that you find find in there. And you can work out if you have platypus or some of the other species where they've sequenced their um, their DNA so they can identify it. There's drones now available with thermal imagery, which is good enough to try and um, identify species across a big area. So just from that little heat signal that they can pick up, they can program computers to say what species it is and uh, cover big areas. So whether it be in New Zealand counting brush tail possums or out in uh, western New South Wales counting pigs and goats, or in this photo, they're looking at um, fruit bat colonies. But one of the real big ones that has taken off is a big change in digital technology. So now we can set up um, audio sound recorders, which can pick up ultra high frequency, including bat, bat, uh, bat. They can pick up, um, you know, the bird calls and produce lots and lots of data. And there's always a challenge with lots of data is someone has to go through it and work it out. But now there's computer programs that can identify the sonograms or can go through even uh, lots of photos and identify what species are being picked up there. So it's all changing, but you know, all these things, have their limitations. Like it's great technology, but you know, how do you know if um, that one bat that flies past your um, sound recorder, um, is it just one bat flying past 20 times or is it 20 different bats? You know, things like this is things that researchers and uh, land managers are sort of trying to grapple with at the moment. But they definitely have a great role in working out what species are on your place. Um, you'll miss some things, but it's a great way to catch some of them cryptic things that are hard to catch with traditional survey techniques. And you can leave them out and um, leave them out for a while and come check them later. It's pretty, um, pretty easy work, but they've got to be set right. So this talk is going to talk about motion detection cameras, but the important thing is uh, to work to understand how they actually are set off particularly um, for um, small creatures. Now, how these cameras are triggered, it's not necessarily just movement, it's a change in the heat pattern. So using passive infrared. So, you know, some small animals and birds don't put off much heat, um, bigger things do. And if that heat signal changes in front of the camera, that's when it's triggered. So it's pretty easy to miss some of the smaller creatures, depending on the climatic conditions at the time. This is a picture here of a, um, a feather tail glider and all the um, tree camera trapping that I've done, we, we rarely pick these up. Well, actually this is the first one. And I do wonder if the only reason we picked it up was that it was on the edge of this tree. Because it's very likely that the tree could have been a very similar temperature to the animal itself, so it didn't set off the um, the the, um, the sensor. So it's just something to keep in mind, particularly if you're looking at birds and small mammals. Now, if you haven't got a camera already, choosing a camera can be a daunting task. Like there's just so many cameras out there. Um, it's been a big industry, particularly in the hunting hunting game. And uh, I guess if it wasn't for um, the hunting industry, we probably wouldn't have the camera so well advanced. But there's lots of um, bells and whistles you can get on your camera now. And for what most of us want to do, we don't actually need a lot of them. You need the resolution to be good enough that you can zoom in enough to try and identify the species. In most cases, you don't need it to be hooked up to a sender's um, messages because often where we trap there might be phone coverage to start with and it could be very annoying getting a lot of um, um, text messages of uh, pictures of grass that are waving around so don't feel like you have to go get the bees knees of cameras how to set up a camera well i'm not going to go into it too far because every camera is a bit different but there's a few basic things that i found useful to understand one is um, make sure your batteries are charged and make sure your STD card is clear because they're the two biggest reasons why your camera is going to fail. The other one is you haven't turned it on and you just set it up and you forgot all about it. So that has happened. 
But when you're looking at cameras, most of these um, cameras take quite a lot of batteries. So rechargeable batteries are a good investment. And um, when you do get your camera, the best thing to do is go online because most of these models have a little YouTube clip somewhere that tells you how to go through all the settings and some of the limitations or good things about or features of the camera. And then a great thing to do is actually just play around at home with your camera, particularly if you're going to take nighttime photos by looking at the flash, uh, because the flash for smaller wildlife and the smaller distances can be a bit of an issue, as um, I'll talk about later. So the thing that you, the camera will ask you when you want to set it up, uh, do you want motion pictures or motion photos? There's other options. There's time lapse, which isn't set off by the motion. It just takes a photo each time and some other things. But um, the thing that we want for wildlife stuff is mainly motion pictures or motion videos. The good thing about motion pictures, they don't take up much memory space. However, the videos do. Now, the benefit of a video is you can see how the animal moves and it might help you identify the species if it's, the imagery is not that great, but it can take up a fair bit of room. Some cameras, you can actually um, program it to take three photos and a five second video, which is a neat way to go. But if you got them out for a long time, it might chew up your memory. Uh, this is just an example of a video of a fox checking out a, a, um, a rabbit burrow. So this was set on a rabbit burrow just out in the Riverina here. There was a few rabbits getting around, but uh, since the fox arrived, they've taken off. And these are a couple of images, and this sort of can show you what can go wrong when you with your images. If you just program it to take one photo, um, often you'll get this, um, where it's a bit hard to identify the species. So I'll ask you, which I'll talk about in a minute, they'll ask you how many photos you want in a, in a burst of photos. So three, I reckon, is the minimum, but you might want more. And this one you can see... Uh, there's one image there and you can tell it is a glider, but you can't really tell if it's a squirrel glider or not, or a sugar glider. Um, luckily, the next um, image on the camera, we got some good views of it. But um, often you do get these type of photos, which can be very frustrating. So you can, um, on most of the cameras, I'll ask you how many pics you want in that burst. I normally set it on three or five. I'll ask you how many seconds between each pick i reckon do them pretty rapidly so when you scroll through them it's just like a um, movement uh, just like a video so you can actually see some movement then i talk ask you do you want a quiet period uh, you can set it up 15 seconds two minutes or five minutes because often something like a brush tail possum they might sit in front of that camera for half an hour and take lots and lots of photos which again chews up space so sometimes it's good just to give it a break for five minutes and then come back Sensitivity is something to consider. If you're trying to get small mammals, um, you want it fairly high. Uh, you can have high or very high. The trade-off with that is little um, grasses and leaves might set it off. So you've got to try and trim them away from the area that you're targeting. You can set the cameras on day and night. And this is where flash comes into it. And, um, and on some of these cameras, you can reduce the power, power of that flash. But in most cases, when we're trying to do um, small mammals and you've just got, a, you've got your camera set up like one or two or three or four or five metres from the target area, the flash will be so bright or white and everything out and you won't be able to see what it is. You've got to always remember these cameras are generally set, uh, have generally been built for large games such as deer and... Um, and other things that people like to hunt. So one thing you can do here is um, with your cameras is um, put some tape over the flash. So you can put masking tape, which I prefer to use. I think there's a bit of uh, uh, insulation tape done on this one, but you can put that um, masking tape over the whole thing if you want, and you'll still get some flash. You can see in this photo here, the camera was only set up about a metre and a half and anything that was in the direct middle of the target area was so white you couldn't see it, but you can see we picked up a bush rat just on the edge. 
So these are sort of things you can actually trial at home of a night just to see how far you can set up the camera and how much flash you need. So now we have a bit of an idea of how we're going to set up the cameras. Now it's time to go bush with them and see what we want to um, and get them out. Let's see what's around. It's always good to ask yourself, why am I doing it? What are the target things I'm after? You can see in this shot, uh, this was part of a nesting predation study. So they'll just set up on artificial nests to see what critters come in to raid the nests. This is another interesting one. A Joel sent me this video. This was a, um, a camera set up to actually look how look up how effective this little flat device um, was in in pouring um, like an insecticide on the um, mangy wombats. Uh, so that's another uh, thing you can do. So if we're going out trying to detect wildlife, uh, you want to maximise your chances. Uh, just don't chuck a camera up anywhere. Try and try and go in a place where you know there's going to be animals. And ways to look for that is to look for runways, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about, or specific habitats. So on hollows, on uh, rocky areas, logs and that type of thing. Water points are great, but mostly in summer. Just remember most of our wildlife doesn't need to drink every day when it's um, conditions like now where there's a lot of water in the landscape. So really hot, hot conditions in the summer where there's not much water in the landscape. They're really good. Baits and attractants are great, and I'll talk a bit more on that. But also dung piles, um, feeding points. So if you see um, some V-shaped type scars in, the, in some of your trees where you have yellow belly gliders, that might be an interesting place to set it up because uh, it won't be just yellow belly gliders feeding on that, on that sap. There'll be other things as well. So let's have a have a look at um, different runways. Actually, one of the best runways um, around is just tracks, like bush tracks. So anything from a bandicoot to a possum to um, dingo to kangaroo and wallabies, often they'll use these tracks. And even some small mammals will move along the edge of these tracks as well if there's good cover on the side. But if you don't have a track, if you walk around through the the grass, if you've got a bit of long grass or even through bush, you'll see definite tracks, just like a sheep track um, in a paddock where animals move around. Uh, animals don't randomly wander. They'll have uh, tracks they like to use to get from one place to another and they'll always use this route. Um, as the animals get smaller, they'll probably want something that's a bit more safe, so they'd probably like smaller tracks where there's a bit more veg around. But... Um, if you spend time and look around your patch of bush, you'll find these. Now, they're not always on the ground. Um, this um, fallen tree here is a perfect example, and we'll show, we did set a camera up on this, and we'll talk a bit about it later, but, you know, it's connecting, you know, um, the ground layer with the trees. It's linking trees together, linking the shrubs with the trees. A very ideal spot. The other good spot is some of these big logs, that, especially bush, um, you know, it's hard to walk around thick bush, but it's easy to walk across the top of a log. And the other spot is just underneath the log. Um, often you'll find little runways for the smaller mammals. Burrows and dens, always useful uh, places to set up cameras. You might think it's just a wombat hole, but um, often other species use these burrows as well. So it's worth setting them up and just seeing what's around. But um, baited stations, I, I really recommend you get a lot of things. Not everything comes to a bait, but it can be uh, bait made up of peanut butter and rolled oats, put into a container and pegged down so the wallabies don't cart it away. Tin of sardines like we have in the left corner there where we've got a little yellow-footed antichinus trying to get in. We also spread a bit of honey on that tree as an attractant. Uh, if you can find a bit of roadkill, an old carcass somewhere, a dead lamb out of the paddock or whatever, peg it down on a spot and hopefully you'll get some of the um, uh, carnivorous animals and um, things that like to scavenge on, um, on roadkill and dead animals. And interesting, you'll find some interesting things. Even wallabies will come up and have a bit of a nibble on a bone or and that type of thing. So you'll be surprised what you get. 
So what we're going to do now is put a few cameras out. So we'll look at um, uh, four different places where I set cameras. I'll talk about why we did it there and how we did it. And then we'll have a look, about, look at what we actually got. So this is that log bridge that I was looking at before. It was a cracker of a spot. Um, when you're out spotlighting and do a lot of spotlighting like I do, these little runways are, are great. Uh, for animals, you always see things um, coming out of the hollows and moving on these to get to the places they, they want to be. When I seen that, I thought I'd have a look to see if it was had a few wear marks on it. And as you can see in that right photo, there's um, it's fairly worn and there was little nail prints all along it. So you know things were using it. You had to find a camera, uh, a tree to put the camera on, which uh, was about uh, probably four metres, three or four metres from the from the tree. Um, the trick now is trying to make sure that that camera is pointing at the place you want it to point. And uh, this is the best way to do it, um, is to put your head exactly where you want to take the photo and make sure that camera is looking straight at you. Uh, you can really get a good sense if it's pointing at you by doing it this way. You can then adjust the camera. I'll just go back one. You can adjust the camera to make sure it's pointing the right way, then tilt the camera down and up by putting a um, stick underneath it or at the back of it. So that's a, a good way to tilt it backwards, uh, up and down. So the first thing we got on the camera was a ringtail possum. Now a ringtail possum is a hard one to get on, um, on your motion sensor cameras because they don't come into baits they, they eat vegetation uh, if you're trying to trap them you can't find a bait that you'll catch them with so you really have to set the trap up on runways or hollows or something like that or a dray to get an image of them so it was great that we got one you can see it's a bit blurry because he's moving fairly quick along that track um, and probably in hindsight with this um, camera I probably should have put it at a bit of an angle so it's looking up the branch instead of straight at it and I'll talk a bit about that later because often uh, things, if they move a bit quicker than that, you'll just get bum shots, just get a tail or a rump. I did put some honey on this um, tree as well as a bit of an attractant. Now that can be a good thing and sometimes it can be a bit of a pain. So you can see the animal on the right there is a mountain brush tail possum. He probably uses that track as well, but he found the honey and he didn't leave it. He was there for a couple of days until all that honey was gone. You can tell he's a mountain brush tail possum by his um, sort of a bit more robust and you got a bit of a rounder leaf than the uh, common brush tail. Uh, yeah, so he hung around for a bit and probably while he was there, um, scared a lot of other things away that might have used it. So, so again, another trade off of putting baits out. And you can see right on the right hand side, we had a little rat turn up. And you can see the flash is probably a little bit strong here because when you zoomed into it, it's a bit hard to see. One of the things that probably give this animal away is that long tail, which again, probably if I had it again, I'd probably try and dampen that flash a little bit more. But that long tail longer than the body uh, indicates it's most likely the black rat, introduced rat. And they, they do like getting up and down trees and it wasn't far from a farm area. So that's probably what that one was. Okay, this is another bush track. And it's a good spot. The landowner that we worked with set cameras on this before and has had some great, great shots of deer and um, deer and dingoes. And I think she put a dead lamb on there one time. So she got wedge tail eagles come down to scavenge and that. So she thought it was the best spot on her place. Uh, we set the camera up. It was only up for a bit less than a week. Um, and see how we're looking up the track. That's a really important thing because, like I said, if something's moving quick, you might just get a lot of bum shots. So that gives the camera more time to get some photos. I sprinkled a bit of um, rolled oats around and, uh, and tipped out a bit of tuna juice from the other that I had left in the car from setting the other traps just as an extra attractant, just to see how we go. And we got a couple of things, only up for two days. It wasn't as successful as I hoped, but... Um, we did get the fox and you can tell, see he's having a bit of a sniff around of that tuna juice. He hung around for a bit and maybe he could have put off a few critters. 
and then we got the the wombat and you can see we only triggered it off when he was right down near the end so if you had it across uh across the track you might only got his rump or missed him altogether so um that's a good reason to be looking up and down tracks when you set your camera this one i was really keen to see if there was bush rats in this patch near batlow so um i tried to set one up for small mammals and you can see sometimes there isn't anything to set your um camera on so i've set it up on a star a half a star picket i've put it in the ground there made for sure it's pretty solid and again i've got another bait just in a drink a water bottle uh wired to there so animals don't cart or cart it away um, it's probably only about a metre and a half away. So like I was saying before, I tried to dampen that flash and I thought it'd be all right. But um, yeah, unfortunately, um, this was the result, these sort of photos. I actually had lots of hits here. There was lots of uh, bush rat activity. This is a bush rat. Um, it has a shorter tail. It sort of looks like a more of a Roman nose, a cuter. Uh, I think they look cuter anyway, less ratty than a black rat. Lots getting about, but this is about the only photo that was a good one. The rest were in this wide area, checking out the bait. And here you can't even see the, the bait container. So from that, I, I know that I need to put a bit more tape on the, um, a bit more tape on the uh, camera if I try and set it up that close again. Now, this is the one that I do do quite a lot of, these baited tree traps mainly because I've done a fair bit of work on squirrel gliders and I'm always interested to find out um, if there is squirrel gliders in, in some of these patches. Sometimes with spotlighting, um, they're very hard to detect. They're often up in the canopy. They turn away from the light so you can't see them. Sometimes you only get a bit of a glimpse and it's hard to confirm if it's a sugar glider or a squirrel glider if you don't get a good look at them. And also in this landscape down in the, down in the Murray Riverina area here, we're always looking for brush-tailed fasca gale because they haven't been seen since the 1800s here, but the odd landowner reckons they see them. But as yet, we still haven't found them, but I'm hoping one day we'll pick them up in these with these traps. The trick is to find a big, large tree. Like most birds, possums, gliders, they will mainly focus their feeding activity in large trees. Um, so that's where you want to be. Uh, they'll be be more likely to encounter your attractants like the honey and the um, what I also do is uh, sardines which you'll see in a minute you've got to find a camera that's a, a tree that's about um, you know four meters away uh, and and uh, have it facing where you've got that bait station and in these pictures uh, you can sort of see that um, you can see the cameras looking back at the little tin of sardines where it gets tricky is in the open woodlands, but often you'll find a big old tree that has a branch that hangs down and you can sometimes attach that, um, attach the camera to that, but often it's a smaller distance. So that's where you've got to look at dampening the, the flash a bit. I'll often get a, how I normally do it. This is my usual mixture. I'll put a bit of, um, get a tin of sardines, put a few holes in it, nail it to the tree. Um, get some uh, water down, some honey. Uh, so some warm water and honey, you can get it mixed up so you can squirt it all over the tree as a attractant. But then I also like to get in there with just straight honey and get it underneath the bark in the nooks and crannies. So it takes them a little while to get it out. Normally the honey lasts probably about, uh, about a week, seven days. So if you're looking for gliders specifically, if, um, seven days you should get it you might get a hit but sometimes we have had a hit like uh, weeks later but it's probably just them coming in to check out the tin because the honey's usually gone by then this was on a site near Tarkata where we knew there was gliders but we didn't know if they were um, squirrel gliders and it was important that we knew that they were there because we we're in an area where it's considered an endangered population so like most things, if you don't know what animal's on your place, you, it's hard to work out what management strategies you should be doing. And that's one of the great things with cameras. It enables people to go and see what's on their place. And if they find one of these animals that needs specific management, uh, then they can uh, they know, know the animal's there and they can start doing that. 
So there's a camera there on the left uh, white box tree pointing at the stringy bark. And here's a little baited tin. I left the cardboard on it, just I thought I might as well leave it on there and just it might be less um, shiny. Uh, I don't know if it makes any difference or not. You can see a brown tree creepers come to check it out, and often they do. I think they're just having a bit of a sticky beak. Sometimes in these um, sardines, the um, uh, the flies will blow it and maggots will come out and you'll get tree crevice skinks and other things come and um, feed on the maggots as well. This is where we had that picture of the um, feather tail glider uh, on the edge. That's that left photo up the top. But um, we also had lots and lots of um, yellow-footed anticinus. They love this um, this type of um, camera trap. You, if you've got a yellow-footed anticinus, you should find them doing it this way. And you can see something's ripped up all this, um, all the cardboard on it. So what could that be? And you can see it was a squirrel glider. That was the first image of the squirrel glider. When the, you can see the cardboard's intact. You can see where I've rubbed honey around the um, around the sardine box. And 16 days later, the glider come back again. And you can see there's no honey left. And the tin's still there, but he's still interested in that tin. I don't think it would be very... Um, the smell wouldn't have been great by then, but um, he, he must have thought it was of interest. So I guess um, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, but the take-home tips... I guess uh, uh, get to know your camera. So get online and play around with your camera at home, particularly if you're thinking about um, trying to get smaller mammals um, and that type of thing. Play around with the flash, see if that um, uh, see if you can get the distance right, and if you can dampen that flash enough that you can get sort of close into rocky outcrops and logs and stuff like that. It's good to have that clear objective, the reason why you're doing it. Um, because that will help you decide where you have to go. Maximise your chance by using baits or placing targeted it, place um, by targeting places where animals are more likely to be found. And get to know the ecology of the critter you're chasing. There will be specific things that you might be interested in, so um, a particular animal that's in your area. So if you're not sure about the ecology and you've done your research but you're still not sure, give a give a call to the, your um, uh, local BCT ecologist or the SOS officer that's um, in charge of that species and you'll find someone that will be able to give you some tips. Um, try and minimize, minimize these false triggers. These things are where grass blows in front of it or cars drive past or um, leaves, leaves um, move in front of the camera. So it's good to have a set of secateurs when you get out there. Um, give it a bit of a trim around where the where the camera is going to be facing. It'll just save you going through lots and lots of um, photos and, and save you on memory space. You know, avoid pointing it towards busy roads, which I've done that a few times, and uh, it's interesting. You a lot more log trucks than you think on some roads. Um, make sure the camera's facing where you want it and I, the best tip is actually put your head get down lay down on the ground or get up against the tree and and put your head where that target area is and make sure that camera is looking straight at you because nothing more frustrating than uh, the camera's not in the right place and you're just getting tails and rumps of animals that you can't identify dampening that flash is um, something that you need to um, have a crack at um, if you're going to try and go for small mammals. Um, so I guess consider memory space. If you're putting your camera out for a long time, maybe not setting it on video might be a, a good thing or just have very short videos. Um, take notes when you set up your camera. So make sure you know which camera um, that each uh, card comes from. And if you set up on your camera an ID, on it that should be recorded in the photo anyway but take note of what settings you used so when you do find that your um, the flash has whitened everything out uh, you can then go not uh, put it down a setting uh, so to keep records because often you forget what you set them on when you go to set them next time um, 
make sure the card is empty, batteries are charged, and don't forget to turn the camera on after you've gone all, all to all that effort to setting it up. And don't forget, I guess, cameras are a great tool, but they're not great for all species. And um, they don't often, re they're a good tool, they're an additional tool, but they don't replace some of the traditional survey methods as well. So I think that's all from me, Joel. Um, I'm happy to answer some questions when we get around to it. So thanks for listening. Good on you, mate. Thanks, <laughs> thanks mate. Oop, that's awesome. Some fantastic stories and images there to go along with some practical tips on camera use. <clears throat> I particularly like the one about turning the camera on. I have to say, you know, guilty as charged. <laughs> Look, don't forget q and is coming. But first, I'll hand over to Dr. James Brazil Boast, the principal college, the uh, prince. I can get it out. The principal ecologist at the BCT. That's right. He's the big wig. James also has a background in academia. I mean, you can't be a doctor without it, right? But since then, he's been integral in the development of the New South Wales government Saving Our Species program, and more recently, the driving force behind the development of the monitoring program here at the BCT. James will briefly chat to us on the BCT's citizen science strategy, which is currently in development, and how you can get involved. Over to you, James. Thanks, mate. Great. Thanks very much, Joel. So I'm going to talk about just briefly, as Joel said, there, our citizen science strategy. So this should be released on our website uh, in the coming months. And it's really about formalizing what we already do a lot is working with our landholders uh, to help understand the biodiversity values uh, on their land and how we can use that information to help manage land and manage biodiversity better. Um, landholders and others in the community are obviously spending 24 7 on their land uh us as scientists come on you know for very small periods of time and try and understand things so it's the landholders that are really best placed to to help us out and get involved so what we're um what we're trying to do is these kind of three pillars to the strategy uh and the way we're going to roll it out the first one is really trying to apply existing data. There are a whole lot of programs out there, a whole lot of groups looking at birds, looking at water quality, looking at uh, invertebrates in the landscape and taking those data sets and really harnessing those to uh, augment the kind of data we're collecting, say under our monitoring program and help us learn about all the biodiversity values uh, on private land across the state, particularly because you know, we do know a lot about biodiversity relatively in things like national parks, but on private land, often we, we really don't know much at all. Um, so it's the uh, BCT landholders are really integral to that. Uh, also, people are probably aware there's a whole lot of different mobile apps out there. So things like iNaturalist uh, and Frog ID and other different apps, which we really want to encourage our landholders to use to record uh, and capture what kind of critters uh, is on are on their land and so um, we're going to be hoping to facilitate some of that and give some training and really encourage their use so we get more data in through those and then the last two which uh, we'll I'll talk a bit more about now and what uh, Mason in his great talk just now has been talking about is remote sensor use so obviously cameras but also audio passive audio detecting devices uh, we're really going to try and, and roll it out and I'll talk about that in a second and also integrating management. So how do we learn about our biodiversity management uh, of biodiversity and how do we learn how to improve it and how do we understand what the impacts of our things like doing more sustainable grazing or planting or any of these kind of activities we might do, how do we learn if they're working and how do we learn to improve them? So in terms of putting the science in citizen science, obviously, uh, Mason has just shown we can put our cameras and we can understand what cute things are running around on our properties, but actually to really harness the scientific value in, in these kind of endeavors, what we want to do is try and design uh, a program where we can accumulate all of the data coming from landholders and really contribute to a, a bigger understanding of, of what's happening across the state. So we can do that by getting people involved in a, in a systematic program where they are deploying things like cameras in a really systematic way uh, at using a particular baits and setting them in a particular way, understanding things like different environmental factors 
uh, associated with where we're putting cameras, what kind of vegetation are they in, what's the rainfall been like around the time we're deploying cameras. And we can start to build up a big data set uh, and really understand what kind of factors about our management or about the, the environment and, and these habitats uh, are contributing to whether or not we see these kind of species in the landscape or whether we're providing good habitat for threatened species or whether different types of grazing regimes or different kinds of land management uh, help or, or hinder uh, providing good habitat for these species. Or what about the history of land management at some of these sites like fire and, and different kinds of, of grazing regimes and things. So we're really after landholders and the wider community. If you're interested in being involved, if you're interested in not only knowing what's running around on your property, but also contributing to answering some of these big questions and ultimately feeding back that information to help our landholders improve the way they're managing their land, then uh, absolutely get in touch. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Another one in this vein is also understanding more directly for some of our agricultural landholders is, are there links between managing for biodiversity uh, and primary productivity benefits, whether those are sort of via things like soil health or pollinators or erosion control. So as Joel mentioned, uh, we are rolling out an ecological monitoring program across all of our sites. So we're really understanding things like vegetation condition uh, and measuring different aspects of biodiversity value. But what we, what we don't know is, do those things relate to uh, different kind of uh, outcomes in terms of yields or different kinds of uh, measures of productivity um, from agricultural enterprises on the same farm and are there benefits there? So if, uh, if you're an agricultural landholder and you're really interested in, in helping out with this and providing maybe some information about your yields and productivity and linking that to the other things where we're measuring, then absolutely get in touch as well. We really love to hear from you. And and everybody's involved, obviously we will feed back this information to everyone. So you really understand how your data collection has contributed to understanding these processes and helping everyone manage their land a bit better. So thank you. Obviously citizen science depends on you guys participating. So uh, if you're interested, please get in touch uh, and definitely send Joel an email. Thanks a lot, Joel, back to you. Awesome, James. Thanks heaps, mate. It looks like our landholders and, and others in the general public can get involved in, in citizen science with the BCT in, later in the year and, and in future years. So that's a really exciting um, opportunity coming up here. So I think we're ready for some questions. I believe we're gonna have some popping up on the screen in a sec. Um, let's just wait and see how we go. The first one is from Toby, a question for James straight off the bat. Do I need to be a conservation agreement holder to be involved in BCT citizen science projects? Yeah, look, that's a great question. You don't. Um, obviously, some of our projects will focus on, on landholders, but also one of the key objectives of the citizen science strategy is really engaging the whole community in collecting these kinds of data. So we do have events uh, that can involve you know, any landholders in the community. We have a partnership with Landcare at the moment. So do get in touch with uh, your local land care and see if you can get in, uh, involved in these kind of activities through that. And obviously all of those kind of apps I talked about, you know, you can get involved just by getting out on your property, recording what you find, putting it through those apps, and it gives us all a broader understanding of uh, what's out there in the landscape. Excellent, excellent, thanks, thanks James. And I reckon that sort of feeds into the next question from Alice that I've got here, it says, what do I do with the species information that I find from the cameras? If it's a special threatened species, who do I tell? Mason, perhaps? Yeah, well, I guess um, there's probably, um, often with threatened species, there'll be an officer in charge uh, from SOS. So if you can track down who that is, but you can always come to the BCT, T, the, uh, if you just ring the normal line, you'll get onto um, someone will put you through to the local ecologist or the appropriate person, and uh, you can um, go through that way. And I've also seen a lot of people going through the environment line as well for um, questions and queries, and they all 
you can get put on to um, the right person that way as well. But um, feel free to call your local BCT office because we're always keen to hear from people and knowing what's out there. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, you know, ways to do it as well, like through Bionet. If you if you if you know what Bionet is, you can upload records to the to the New South Wales database, and we'll actually be um, providing a video. We've just finished it, and it'll be uh, available on the resources tab of the website very soon on sort of being able to utilise the Bionet um, platform to to register species records. So that's a good way to do it as well. Uh, next question from Peter, I think for you too, Mason. What types of species are not suitable for detection by motion cameras? Well, I guess anything that walks in front of the camera and is warm enough is going to set it off, but there's a lot of uh, animals that are hard to get in front of that camera, I guess. So things like uh, greater gliders, um, very difficult. That, that species eats only eucalypt leaves, so you can't really make a eucalypt leaf bait because there's plenty out there and um, they often uh, their den trees are in the top of top of trees where it's very difficult to get a camera onto their hollows and they rarely come down low they're probably the only place you might get them is if you can find a, a tree where it's obvious a glide has been landing then running up as it glides between trees but yeah it's very going to be very difficult to get them species uh, and of course, a lot of the some of the reptiles and some of the birds are going to be hard to get, um, mainly because they don't have that good heat signal that's going to set the trap off. And then a lot of things like um, uh, some of your reptiles don't even come to the surface very often, so um, they might be living under the leaf litter and stuff. So yeah, there's a lot that are going to be difficult. There are a lot that actually love coming to baits, so you'll always get brush tail possums and um, wallabies who and that sort of thing but um there'll be some that are a bit more hidden. okay great thanks mate and um i'll add too that things like micro bats um wouldn't be suitable for motion cameras you know given they're sort of yay big and fly awfully fast so you know and we you mentioned yeah. james mentioned those audio detection so uh equipment out there and something like an anabat which is the echolocation recorder, um, is, is a better suit for something like a microbat um, as well. You will get microbats right, that so... will just be a pass across the screen. <laughs> a blur, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Pat, Pat asks, do you have any tips for capturing spotted quolls on camera, Mason? Well, I've done a lot of looking for spotted quolls but haven't found too many. So maybe I'm not the best person to give advice, but I think it's just where I was actually. But... I think um, an old carcass is one of the best things. If you can find a bit of roadkill, um, if you can see the camera on, on that, um, target their habitat. Um, at certain times of the year, the quolls are up in the granite sort of rocks a lot more. So that's a, a good place to be. But the other place, I think this is all for most of the mammals, whether it's possums or gliders or any kindness, Sometimes your most productive areas down in your gully lines, that's where you get the highest density of many of these animals. And if that's what the quolls are preying on, uh, they might be down there. And I guess if you've got a good chook cage near your place, <laughs> I, 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 I'll hear a lot of stories they do like the odd chook. So um, that might be another place to set up a trap, a camera trap. So, yeah. A question from me, actually, coming from Joel. Um, have you? Um, can you recognise a latrine site for a for a quoll? Yeah, it's well. They, um, it's often up in the in the rock rocky area, but um, yeah, there'll be a bit of scent, and you should see sort of characteristic scats, which are slightly more twisted than a um, than a fox. But what you can do, if you're not sure what it is, if you pick up that scat use gloves because you know a lot of the predatory animals carry diseases you don't want put in a plastic bag and you can send it off to someone to get the hair sampled and they should be able to tell you if it's a quoll or a uh, a fox i've sent a lot of uh, scats off that have been foxes but um so it can be a bit tricky so send it off yeah great 
Um, Keith has chimed in too. Thanks, Keith, to say that Team Qual has a good ca has good camera results for spotted tail quolls. Um, UOW University of Wollongong is that Wollongong? Wollongong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they have good camera results, so good idea to have a look there too. Um, Greg asks another one for you, Mason. You keep your keep your um, seat warm there, James. Is it worth checking the focal length of the cameras? Many are set to two to four meters. Yeah, and I guess that's why you want to really check on the um, uh, check on the specs of the camera and go through the the YouTube. They're very handy. They are that um, nearly every model's got a YouTube clip how to use it. But that's where you want to play around with your camera a bit too. Um, because every camera is a bit different and like they are designed for um, bigger game, but um, yeah, so I, yeah, I think it's worth just checking all them things out and you can do that by playing around with them at home before you set them up. Cool. Excellent, mate. Thank you. Um, Nancy's chimed in with what could be a tricky one. I reckon I am interested in getting images of the crayfish slash yabbies on Jamboree Mountain. Any tips? Any tips for aquatic? I mean, given the heat signal, I, I would Ooh. suspect not, but maybe. Could be tricky. It might, um, well, you could try it, but um, like where do you set them will be the challenge. Um, it might be more, you might be better off just getting out there and uh, looking for them and getting photos. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. It, Potentially you could pick them up. Like I've picked up slugs and and caterpillars and stuff like that on cameras before, but it it will all that matter. What's going to be the difference is what the background temperature is on the the ground or the tree or whatever substrate they're moving on. So it's going to be hit and miss. Um, but you can only try it. But um, where do you set the camera up for a crayfish? Is a uh, question if it's one of them land ones you can often find their burrows and you might be able to set something up on that maybe that might be worth doing but um yeah the ones in the water a bit hard to get i reckon okay thanks mate um paul asks here he says so it looks like with your sardine tin you don't open it but you puncture it and nail it on a tree is that how you do it and when you use sardines for trapping say cats, for example, do you do the same thing, i.e. just puncture the tin? Yeah, well, the animals are coming in for the, the scent of it and you don't actually want them to eat it because then they won't be won't be there for very long. So, yeah, I just put the holes in the in the tin and uh, nail it to the tree so it can't be cut, carted away. And um, the animals haven't been able to rip open the tin, uh, so that's that's been good. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what I do. They only last a certain while if um, it's a bit warmer and the blowflies are active because they soon clean them out. But, um, yeah, that's how I do it. Awesome. Um, I've got another one here. This is a great question. Any tips to capture koalas? Is it good to use baits? And if so, what kind? Well, well baits, again, I think it's going to be like the um, greater glider. The, it's a bit hard to set a eucalypt bait for them. But you may see, um, uh, you, you probably will get them on tracks. So if you set up, set them up on runways, as if their koalas are moving around, that's one way. You can can see what trees koalas have used by looking for scats under trees. And um, often there'll be the, the scratch marks up the side of it. So I guess you could target that, but it's gonna be very hit and miss. And as you know, a lot of koalas when they found a spot they're happy in, they'll sit there for a fair while um, before they move again and where their next move is, um, who knows? But um, yeah, I guess the koala's got to come down the tree if you just want a picture of it. If the koala's up in the tree, you put it at the base of the tree, it's going to come down at some stage. So hopefully it goes down the side of the tree, you'll um, get the camera on. So that might be one way if you just want to get a picture, I guess. I can add to that, Joel, if, I mean, if you're really interested in getting a picture, yeah, it's quite difficult. I think the, probably the most successful uh, method people have used is attaching a camera to one of those blinky drinkers, a little drinker thing up a, a tree where they come in to drink and you capture them that way. But if, you, if you're just interested in understanding whether you've got koalas on your property, 
Uh, something that we've had success with is the audio recorders and you can get quite cheap little ones called audio moths. And there actually are some programs where we can automatically identify whether it's male koalas calling. So yeah, BCT landholders, especially if you think you have koalas and you're interested to know, then the BCT does have some audio moths. We can probably get out there and, and put some up and they're pretty easy to use and pretty we can tell you quite quickly whether there's koalas around. That's a that's a great tip, James, and and that goes for, some, for stuff like frogs and stuff as well. You know, like um, with audio moths and the larger, you know, I guess more expensive song meters. If you know, if you if you're willing to invest, you can put those those um, that those pieces of equipment out and record for yeah you know, weeks and months. And and there's good software out there to be able to detect all those you know any species that that makes sound and, you know, unique sounds. So a great tip. Um, awesome. So Mason, you mentioned sending off scats. Bob's asking where to, where do you send the scats off to? Yeah. Well, I guess as if you, if it's something like quails, uh, someone mentioned team quail before, look for the people that are doing work on that species. Uh, if it's the thing that you're interested, if that's the species you're interested in and often they'll have someone that they've been using, um, you know, I've, in the past, um, Barbara Triggs, who wrote that great book, um, Scats, Tracks and Other Traces, I used to send stuff to her and she looked at cutting the uh, hair in half and you can sort of examine the cross-section of the hair and say what it is. But now there's also DNA that people can look at. So I guess if you're not sure, again, talk to your um, local ecologist, whether it's BCT or SOS or the local university and they'll have someone local that they'll... Um, they'll help you out with. Um, yeah, but you've got to find who's working in that area. That's probably the best, the best, um, best way to go. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mason. And look, you know, without um, committing myself to lots and lots of work, I'm more than happy to help landholders with, um, with questions that they, that they have. And I think we're going to put my email address in the, um, in the chat. Um, as part of sort of the end of this of this webinar, so yeah, please touch base. Same with you know, touch base with me about citizen science stuff as well. So, you know, questions are and and um, you know any advice or assistance you need, I'm here to help. Um, so there's a couple of questions here, Mason, about um, brands of cameras. Now, are most some, uh, Nigel's asking are most trail cameras the same, and Jennifer's asking you know um, to provide some brands that perhaps you, you recommend. Have you found some that are better than others? I mean, without us being able to promote brands, per se. Yeah, well, I guess I can really only say the ones I have used um, and which ones are typically out there. Like the Reconyx is, is an expensive camera, but it's a good one, and that's the one BCT has a few of them, and other people use them. They're pretty good. Uh, there's one that I used with the uh, their local Brungle Tumut um, land council guys we bought it or they bought a few cameras and i've been doing some camera trapping with them they were a swift they're called swift 3c and they're a bit cheap and actually they were a very good i thought but um if you get on the get online you'll see lots of different reviews out there um so it's probably the best way but them two cameras are good one's a bit more expensive than the other but both of them will do what you need them to do great Okay, thanks so much, mate. And with a minute and a half to go, I have to say that um, sadly our time is up. Thanks again, Mason and James. Some awesome tips for deploying wildlife cameras and a fantastic opportunity is coming up for landholders to get involved in citizen science with the BCT. But don't go anywhere just yet. I need to inform you guys about the next webinar. That's right, we are well prepared today. And I can tell you that on Wednesday, the 22nd of June, we'll be hosting another webinar. That's right. This one will provide an insight into a woodland bird PhD thesis we're sponsoring as part of our scholarship project. The thesis is one of seven which will be sponsored over the next three years by the BCT and many will require survey sites across the state. So tune in to not only hear about woodland birds and the research we are sponsoring, but also how you and your property could assist in these cutting edge research projects. BCT's own senior ecologist and bird nerd, Tiffany Mason, will also present on how some of our landholders are undertaking innovative work on their properties to protect woodland birds and their habitats. So I reckon strike while the iron's hot,
click on the link in the chat window and register for that one before you leave. Do it. All right, and with that, I say thanks again, everyone. Just by being here, you have shown a desire to better understand the fauna species that share our continent. And we much appreciate you joining in. If you'd like to learn more about the BCT, take a look at our website. We have a chunk of resources there, providing information and, and, and advice on a range of management topics. And excitedly, we are developing a free online learning unit tailored to BCT landholders and their agreements. So watch this space. We would also love to hear your feedback on the webinar. So if you can take the time, complete a short survey, that would be much appreciated. Again, the link is in the chat window, please. So that'd be appreciated. That's all we have time for today. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon. Cheers, guys.